Hello and welcome to the next episode of Coffee and Comebacks. And today I'm joined by Leon Lloyd. Leon's an ex-professional rugby player and he's going to give us an insight into his career. But it's what Leon has done since transitioning from elite sport into the commercial environment that we're really going to spend some time focusing on today. Because Leon is the co-founder and a business owner of Centrum Solutions. And we're going to find out more about, about what the, the business offers and the work that Leon's not just involved in now, but is, is involved in looking forward and, and what's on the horizon. So that'll be really interesting for our listeners to hear. Before we go into that, Leon, could you just give us an insight into you, who you are and, and your journey to date? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for having me on, Sam. Um, that's, I suppose to say who I am now, which is what I was saying, who I was, who I used to be. <laughs> So you mentioned before I used to play rugby um, and no one wants to be a former anything, but I am a former professional rugby player. Grew up in uh, inner city Coventry. Uh, my dream as a kid was to always play football uh, and not rugby. I never heard about rugby. So rugby took me down a different path. And I started playing at the age of 13. And then I was very fortunate to have played England schoolboys. Got selected at 16 and I signed for Leicester Tigers at the age of 16. So went across up the M69 to play sign for Leicester Tigers. Uh, I was there for a long time, played with a great side. Uh, won the odd trophy along the way, very fortunate to play for England as well, and then moved down to Gloucester and played a year at Gloucester as well. So that was my early days. Uh, debut at, um, sorry, Time Pro at 16, finished at 30. So I've been retired for 15 years now. And yeah, it, since I've been retired, I've been sort of initially stuck in that space of who am I? You know, what's my purpose after having, you know, living the dream for so long, playing professional sport. So I've been on this little crusade of helping my peers and also the next generation of of athletes and also members of the military which i'm sure we'll come on to uh, prepare for their transition uh, and you know and, and things they can be doing whilst they're competing uh, and serving so that when they do come out or, and finish they're in a far better place yeah brilliant and what about so um in terms of your your lifestyle and the life that you live now what do, what does that look like do you still have some involvement with sport and do you bring sport into your into your lifestyle now? Yeah, I, I feel very privileged to have played sport and I, I'm a massive believer of your product of your environment. And who I am today was absolutely shaped by those incredible you know, team members that I have. If they were here, I wouldn't say they're incredible, obviously, because I wouldn't, I wouldn't give them that credit. But, uh, but I think we all feel very lucky to have had that. So yeah, sport's an important part of my life and my family's life. Um, I'm involved, I'm not, when I finished playing, I sort of I was a little bit lost when I finished playing, so I turned my I turned my back on the sport a little bit because I retired through injury, um, and then I didn't get back involved in rugby for I'd say probably four or five years. And my first involvement back in, I didn't want to be a coach. That's one thing I knew I didn't want to do. I didn't want to have that you know the training and all those things are great, but then not having that the adrenaline of that release on a match down a Saturday. I, I, speaking from speaking to lots of my old teammates who were coaches, it's not the same. So I thought I realised I didn't want to do that. So that was an easy decision. So I got involved in the judiciary side uh, of sport. So I'm involved on, I sit on the, the RFU, uh, EPCR, so European Professional Rugby, and also World Rugby Judiciary Panel. So if someone has a red, has a red card or is cited or they do something uh, wrong, uh, then I join a panel and we sort of uh, go through and determine what the sanctions are, if there are a sanction from there. So that that sort of helped me get back in, fall back in love with rugby again, because I'm sort of involved, but uh, not as time consuming. So you've mentioned how getting back involved in the sport was part of, you know, moving from that place of being stuck and redefining your purpose. What else helped you move from that space into, you know, the journey that you're on now in the commercial world? I suppose, I suppose having a perspective what you don't have as, a, as an athlete you're so focused on the the Saturday to Saturday the structure you know I could tell you in pretty much two months time on a Friday at 9 a.m where I'd be what I'd be wearing what I'd be eating and you get reliant on that structure so when that's taken away you understand that rugby you know or sport in general is such a small part of your life and uh, as I mentioned I, I, was, I was quite a selfish player um, where I sacrificed everything to make sure I was ready for the match at the weekend uh, and my wife, uh, my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, uh, she must have been, uh, she was on the, the the brunt of it all, I think, because um, no, I wouldn't allow anything. And no different to any of the other guys either. We would make sure that we were right for the weekend. And then what I realised was when the sport had finished with me, because I was injured, you know, it wasn't a choice that I was able to make. So when the sport had decided that it finished with me and I looked around, I realised I was just a small part 
of a big machine. And they carried on, and rightly so, because they had another game to focus for on the Saturday. And when you look around, you see who's around with you. The team are not there. You don't just you don't just you don't just lose your you know your job, but you lose your support network. You lose your your sporting family. A large part of your life, I'd say, eighty percent of your life is gone, or your contacts are gone on that moment when your career's ended. And the twenty percent that's left, you know, arguably the ones that have. I was selfish towards throughout my career, but they were still there to pick up the pieces. And, and when I'm not, and I wasn't in as such a good shape as what, you know, I'd, I'd like to have been in. So I think that perspective came from that understanding. We just had our, our first daughter at the time we were living down in Cheltenham. Um, so when I was figuring out how to be, a, a, you know, a, a father of a daughter, which is, is tough anyway, without trying to you know, relaunch yourself as your career. Um, we're living in a new city, uh, a, new, a new place down there which had only been there for a year. So we had lots of things going on. And I think my friendship group, which I developed um, through sport and also outside of sport, they were really, really helpful for me. Kept trying to keep me, get me out, get me involved in stuff. They knew that I'd sort of gone within myself. But if they hadn't kept reaching out, is it's very easy to say, oh, I'm busy or I can't do that or, you know, close the, close down the, the shutters and make yourself go inward. Um, but they they were persistent and they kept going and going and going and they sort of brought me out of my, it took me about 12 months, but they got me out of my shell. Uh, then I started thinking, you know, I need to look forward rather than looking back and, you know, I was a form of this and I used to do this. It's more like, who am I now and who am I going to be in the future? I think that was a real eye opener for me. Uh, one which I wish I'd thought about more whilst I was um, competing. Yeah, and I think it'd be good to just touch on that, if that's OK, around that preparation phase, particularly if, as you say, your career, whether it's sport, whether it's military, you know, we see it a number of times where it will just come to an end abruptly, you know, through injury or for other reasons that that it might happen. It might be that actually you're cut from the squad or, you know, there are lots of reasons why why careers can end. And that can then, as you say, remove your identity, everything that you've known. Um, so, yeah, how did you sort of how did you focus into that and what are the things that now you have learned and seen from you know your experience but others around you what are the things that you wish you had had opportunity to do to prepare for moving on from rugby into your new phase yeah really great question uh, Sam I think uh, I was approached to to go and mentor and do some work with the RPA which is the Rugby Players Association to players who are coming through and largely because I was very proactive as a player so yes I played rugby but I also had my fingers in lots of different pies I'd set up a couple of businesses whilst I was whilst I was playing I needed that distraction towards the end of my career you know if you have a bad game and you, you dwell so much on it, the game it just leads into training so I needed something else to take my focus away uh, from the sport so I was always busy I was networking I'd just been on this database I didn't realize how important it was or how important it was going to be after I'd finished but it's something that I'm really grateful for that I did so I ended up writing a book um, from bootroom to boardroom, life after sport. And it is, it's certainly not a book about, you know, how good I thought I was as a player. It's more a book about if I had my time again, like we just said, if I had my time again, what would I tell a younger version of myself? You know, taking into account the ultimate highs, you know, of playing for your country, uh, winning European Cup finals and league trophies and everything else, the devastating lows of being dropped for your, you know, your country, not um, being picked for finals and career ending injuries. But more importantly, all the bits in between in the middle. So the people that you meet, the experiences that you have, the life skills that you develop. And how could how could uh, other people that are coming through learn from mistakes that I'd made and other people that had made who'd gone before them? And that, that helped me. It was really cathartic in a way, because before I'd written that book, that the longest thing I'd written was probably a text or a tweet. You know, I literally wasn't I wasn't I just I played sport and yes, I did. Uh, I worked in business, but to actually like brain dump that information of those experiences and I ended up with this massive manuscript of stuff of words which was very personal to me and I, I went through it and my, my wife um she worked at Next at the time she's a copy uh, editor she went through it and ripped it down from that big down to that big uh <laughs> saying it, you know it wasn't relevant and it was too personal um and it ended up being this this manual if you like for me it's, it was just great for me to get stuff off my chest stuff that I was holding on to uh, and I just, you know, and it, it sort of went out there into the world with a target audience for me was uh, athlete, current athletes who were maybe thinking about what's next for them. Uh, and then I suppose in hindsight, of thinking about it, when I was playing, you don't sort of think what's next because you think you're invincible and you think, oh, I'll think about that next season or I'll do that next year. Then all of a sudden 
you know, if an injury happens or or, you, or something tragic happens, then that that's right there on your doorstep, and you don't really put things in place. So, a lot of ex players um, and also the corporate world got hold of it, and then I was sort of approached to go down that route of keynote speaking around um, lessons from sport to business, you know, elite sport to business, what the transferable skills, the leadership, the culture, the teamwork, all the things that you pick up as be, by being part of an elite environment that you don't realize you're picking up. You don't, you don't go to university to learn it. You sort of, you're there because you're accountable and the values that you have to have to be a part of that environment just are instilled in you. And you don't realize how valuable they are when you leave that environment. So I, th I think that was a, an eye opener. And I'd love to be able to say I planned it to go that way, but I'd be absolutely lying. It was a, a byproduct of just me sort of brain dumping into a book. Uh, and, and, and that sort of led me then to go on to study it even further because there were no um, data or research. There wasn't much because rugby turned professional in 96. Um, so all the data and the stuff you'd read in the news and all the horror stories around, you know, death, depression, uh, bankruptcy, divorces, all those stats were all out there to, to be read. And they're all around the big sports like football, NFL, NBA, all the, the major sports. So I went to, I went to university and studied, I uh, did my dis first dissertation on around uh, less again around lessons from sport to business how can a, your employer help the individual then I went and did my master's uh, and my my thesis for my MBA was again around how do you um, as, as an individual how do you prepare yourself better uh, and now I'm doing my PhD uh, on, on the exact same thing about leadership and change management so I've gone from someone who left school at 16 uh, to sign pro to later in life going down the, the academic route but again it's all around the stuff I'm passionate about around transition, change management, leadership, all the stuff I've learned from sport. So I, I would never have thought that uh, back then. And my teachers and my head, my head teacher would never have thought that I'd be doing a PhD, but yeah, that's where I am. Wow, that, that is incredible and inspirational. And actually the, you know, the, the words that popped into my head when you were talking through that was about, but it's feeding your passion. It's different when you're, you're getting involved in something that you are genuinely passionate about and you're taking it on board in terms of how you live your life and the work that you're doing. So I can imagine it's just, you know, completely fulfilling in a different way. It doesn't feel like you're going to just, yes, you're, you know, you're going to get qualifications and it looks fantastic, but actually I, I'm sure you get a lot from it personally and professionally from the, you know, the experience that you're going through. Yeah. So my, my, my undergraduate degree was on leadership uh, management and that was tough as I say, because I hadn't written anything before and academic writing and reading journals was really, really tough for me. And it was in addition to my day job. So I was actually, I was, I was um, running a charity called Switch to Play at the time. So I was working, I was balancing family life, I was balancing social, personal life, social life, and then studying at the same time. And it was distance learning. That was really tough because it's in addition to what I was doing. And then I realized my passion piece was around when I did the dissertation. So when I did my MBA, I, I managed to blend that around my day job. So that wasn't in addition to, you know, helping athletes or members of the military to transition. It was, I was actually taking challenges that they were having or what industry was seeing or even government policy, going away and studying it as part of my, my MBA modules and then taking it back and embedding that in that within a uh, switch to play organization. So that didn't feel like it was an addition. It was, it was awesome. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done, but it was also really, really enjoyable because I could see the value that I was able to create and the knowledge I was getting from people far cleverer than me and just taking, just literally like a sponge, taking that in and implementing that in, in an organisation. So that, that's the reason why I've gone down that path. The same with the PhD. That, that, that's a huge commitment, especially when, you know, I've got young children and a family and everything else, but it doesn't feel like it's, I'm living my life and I'm doing a PhD. The PhD is intertwined in who I am you know you talk about passion and it's absolutely a passion piece for me so yes it's tough but it's thoroughly enjoyable as well yeah and well I can't wait to see the outputs and I'm sure you'll share some of the the findings from the the research is that six seven years that's going to take to do it's actually a PhD uh, by portfolio so I should be finished within two years oh uh, wow but I need to get I need to get my head down and get stuck into it uh, but the, the plan is for that anyway yeah, well, good luck. Well, I can emphasize slightly, nowhere on the same level, but I left school at 16 and obviously joined the, the military and I'm currently at uni on my MBA. 
and um yeah when you've not been through university one it's a great experience because well i love using their sports facilities at uni um in birmingham that was there this weekend 50 meter swimming pool an amazing gym <laughs> i like wow i wish i'd gone to uni just for the sports facilities but yeah it is but again i mean i've got a call at six o'clock with on our group presentation and yes it takes time out of your day but actually it's stuff that you know that you're interested in you know you're going to get something from it and i think what i wanted to link it to is your point about connections because i think if there's anything that anybody can do even before they are thinking as you say before they're thinking about what's next it's just ensure they nurture connections and recognize that everything is about relationships and the more positive relationships they have both within their current networks, be that rugby, be that another sport, be that military, actually when they move into, you know, people will move through their phases at different times, won't they? So players that have gone on to industry or ex-military that have left. So keeping those connections and not losing them can be one of the most powerful things you can do. Do you, do you agree? And, and would you one, 100%, recommend one, that one, as well? 100% and you don't maybe I didn't realize at the time when I was building those connections how powerful they'd be and how worthwhile but I'd say 70 to 80% of the people I do business with now are the people I've met and cultivated relationships with when I was playing sport and people do business with people so if you're a good person people will remember that and they'll look to do business with people who are good people so um yeah that, that's that's really important so I spent a lot of time in my early days when I after my first injury my first knee injury I was out for a few months and I went and shadowed different elements within Leicester Tigers the club I was at so I worked in the ticket office I worked with the groundsman I worked in the accounts department I shadowed the the MD the CEO at the time as well just to get a feel for what does it take to run an organization like that and the, the off-field stuff because I knew that playing rugby was going to end at some point and what was I good at what was I going to do next and it was really good for understanding the things that I didn't want to do so I realized that I didn't want to work in accounts just by getting, and it was, it was a great couple of days because it was, it was fascinating, but I realized, yeah, that's not for me. Uh, but, uh, but I think you don't, you don't know what you don't know. So by experimenting and going around and meeting people, the same, same for the hospitality stuff. If you're not picked in sport or you're rested or you're asked to go and do a club commitment, you'll go and meet with match day sponsors and, and rather, rather, and that's in your contract, you have to do it. So rather than turn up there thinking, oh, you know, I'd rather be out there on the pitch and I don't really want to talk to anybody. How long have I got? And literally watching your clock so you can actually just go in and do your 15 minutes of leave. I was never that person. I was that person thinking, well, I'm here now. It's 15 minutes or 20 minutes or half an hour, whatever it is, of my life that I'm never going to get back. So I might as well make the most of it. And I did. And I approached every one of those opportunities as an opportunity to, to give something as opposed to take something. And that, that, that's a difference, you know, when you, when you talk about networking, about you going in there and trying to, oh, what can you get? What can I get from you? That They're very short-lived uh, relationships. And at the time I was playing sports, so I was living the dream. I was speaking to individuals who supported the team I played for. So, you know, even if they weren't a super fan of me, they were a super fan of the team we're playing for. So they were intrigued to, and wanted to understand more about what goes on behind the scenes. And I would just give information, I'd share access to different things and I found that just cultivated some really really strong relationships with successful people and successful people. and I learned from people that's why I'd go in and shadow them and get work experience all whilst I was playing and again if I had my time again I would do more of that you know I'd absolutely do more of that because understanding that one day it, your career is going to be over and your next career is far longer than your sporting career um, I'd prioritize that and that, that's that's what I tried to uh, put across in, in my research and the stuff, I, the stuff we're doing at Switch to Play as well about understanding what's around you and taking advantage of it. Yeah, I think that's a brilliant message. You know, what can you give? Just walk into a room and think, okay, why would people want to engage with me? How's it going to benefit them? Because ultimately, you know, the, it's karma, isn't it? It, it yeah. comes around and, and you, as you say, build really meaningful, mutual, beneficial relationships. And um, just wanted to pull out something around transferable skills that you've mentioned a, a couple of times and certainly something I've witnessed, um, particularly when it comes to sport or military, where it's, 
it seems as though oh, that's your skill. Your skill is to play rugby. Your skill is to play football. But then stripping it back and seeing what's behind that around the discipline and the commitment and the resilience and all those other elements. What sort of advice would you give around how individuals can articulate transferable skills from elite sport or other areas? Yeah, I think the first thing I would say is, and by the way, what I'm saying is I, I didn't know this until afterwards. Uh, I learned this the hard way, uh, is you are not your job. So um, I was always Leon, the rugby player. I was never Leon, you know, the boyfriend, the husband, the son, the brother, the charity, you know, the charity ambassador, the non-exec. I was any of those. I was Leon, the rugby player, first and foremost. And that can be taken away from you and it will be taken away from you at a point in time. So I, what I'd say is identify now, if it was me now, I'd be, I'm all those things. Oh, and I play rugby. And that my identity is not wrapped up in it so much in my job, because if you all those are the things, the skill sets that you bring, rugby might shape a lot or sport might shape a lot of those areas. But that's just a, a part of who you are. And I think that adds to the challenge when people leave a very structured world or routine is when they're so wrapped up and that gets taken away. Then they're like, well, who am I? What is my purpose? What's the point of getting out of bed in the morning if I can't do the thing I've done for the last 10, 15 years? Whereas if you're able to look at it through a different lens, um you can use that and find a positive out of that you know i would feel lucky to have that experience how can i use that experience to go on and do something different and i think once you look at it through that that way that that lens it's easy to identify your transferable skills and you're trying you're told all the time and I, I work with the military and i work with elite sport and we're always told we've got lots of transferable skills but unless you know what they are there's no point in having them you know you, you told it like, oh great i've got transferable skills brilliant and then your career ends you're like well you know those transferable skills you told me about what are they? Uh, and, and also, if you don't know how to use them in, you know, not all skills are transferable. So unless you know how to use them in a new sector or in a new career, then they're not transferable and there's no point having them. So I think a lot, a lot of the time when I'm speaking to individuals is I help them identify what their transferable skills are, because what may seem a sought after skill in Civvy Street or in the real world, if you like, might just be part of the norm for you and I, because being on time, you know, being accountable, you know, being resilient, that's just normal. You know, you don't, we haven't learned that in a book. That's just part and parcel of being successful in our previous careers. So sometimes people don't know how to dial those, those, they call them soft skills. I don't, I think they're more core skills than soft skills because they're really important. How do you dial up those core skills? Uh, because not everyone has them. They don't, they're not, they don't have them. You, you, you only, when you step outside of those environments, you realize what separates, you know, you from, you know, the, the average person. Um, and I think that's really, that's really important. And sometimes it's just about translation as well as transferable. So yes, it's transferable, but how do they translate into a different environment? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point, actually. And I think it's the, the difficulty you can be for people is articulating it in relation, as you say, to what could be a new role or a new environment. So that, that can really be helpful. The other thing that sort of links to that, actually, and I wanted to ask a little bit more about if that's okay because you mentioned about keynote speaking and I believe you have um, another interest that you're involved in which is best um, bespoke elite speaker trust is that right yeah, would you be able to give us some more training. information on that training um, so would you be able to give us some more information on that and what that looks to well the purpose of it in terms of anybody that that might want to engage with it but also what you've seen when people do engage with that sort of program and, and what the outcome looks like as they they sort of complete it yeah absolutely as part of a as part of your job as a as an athlete you have to do q and a's you've got to meet people and the girls it wasn't something that i would always warm towards i wouldn't i wouldn't run towards that those things i did it because i had to do it and if i'm honest there's a thing called glossophobia which is the fear of public speaking uh, and it's up, ranked up there people put that either just before or just after fear of dying which is weird when you think about it how high people rate it and i'm one of those people that tries to you know, face your fears and do it anyway type of person. And it was something which um, made me uncomfortable. That's that feeling that in your stomach, um, a little bit of imposter syndrome and with stuff. But I lean into those things and um, I actively go out and find those things that make me uncomfortable, that take me out of my comfort zone. And it sort of led me down a career of keynote speaking myself. And alongside the book I wrote, which I mentioned before, I was found myself going into organizations, talking to huge, huge, you know, blue chip organizations around culture and people and resilience. And then thinking there, stood in front of 400 people thinking, oh my goodness, what can I teach? What can I knowledge can I share with all these successful men and women? Um, so myself and my business partner on that is a guy called Paul McVeigh, who's a former Spurs 
um, Norwich, a Northern Ireland football player. And also now, he, he retired 15 years ago as well. Coincidentally, we met on a on a corporate governance, not a very sexy name, for, uh, a sexy course, but we, we met on a corporate governance training programme. Uh, and we just we put together our different experiences of keynote speaking and design best, as you said. Uh, and we help people who have got stories. Everyone's got, you know, amazing stories to tell. Um, they may not know how to share them or they may not know. They may want they may want to think of a career choice, uh, maybe as a career as a keynote speaker, or it might just be career progression and want to be better at speaking in public uh, to their teams, internal teams, to their board or trustees. So we take people on a journey uh, through our speaker program. And we cover the five, basically we cover the five, our framework is five acronym, an acronym of five letters. So it's speak, S-P-E-A-K. So S is storytelling, P is presence and performance, E is emotion, A is understanding your audience, and K is knowledge. And we help people to understand their uniqueness and how can they make their story relatable to the audience. And sometimes that can be tricky because, you know, if I'm standing up in front of a room full of people and none of them like rugby, none of them have heard of me, in fact, 50% of them don't even like sport, how are my stories and my experience, how can it be relatable to someone who sits over there in that, in that seat, you know, who feels like they're forced to listen to me speak? So there's, there's a skill to actually articulate in your experiences uh, so that other people can, um, can take something home from them. And that, again, it's something that it doesn't feel like work. It's something I'm really passionate about. And, you know, I get, I get the chance to work with hugely successful people who feel they haven't got anything to share. They were World Cup winners, you know, members of the, you know, the, the SAS, UK Special Forces, we work with business leaders, captains of industry, uh, Paralympian champions, we've got so many different famous and uh, successful people, but they just need a little push or a little nudge in the right direction to share their story with the rest of the world. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I'd love to find out more and we'll make sure that we include some of those links so that anybody listening can you know, as I say, just engage, maybe find out more, get it, get involved in, in the programme. The key thing I wanted to put out there actually reminds me when a few years ago I engaged with a coach around um, speaking because I was going on a, to a particular event with the company and I thought actually I really want to hone in on what I could be doing better and it was really eye-opening and I, I think the one thing you drew out there that has always stuck with me is about making it about the audience and I remember saying that I've started to feel nervous for the first time before I go on you know to, to the stage or whatever and actually what he pinpointed was that it's because I was making it about myself and when you make yeah. it about yourself you're putting all of the pressure on your shoulders you're thinking that everybody's looking at you and actually what they care about is themselves and what yeah. they're caring about is what's in this for me so if you put the focus on the audience think about the sort of things that might you know interest them and add value to them but then also think well it's all about them it's not about me there it removes some of the the fear and the nervousness what well, certainly worked for me anyway in terms of just making me feel less fearful whether it made me a better speaker or not that's obviously it will do I'm sure it did but, I'm but sure no, the audience piece definitely sort of removes some of the, yeah, the nervousness and fear. I don't know if you relate to that or. Absolutely. I think they, uh, there's like a light bulb moment when you realise it's not about you and people would turn up on that. Oh, I'm going to talk about this particular point in time where I achieved this. I'm like, that's great. That's really good. And we, we have an SFW, uh, which I won't swear on your, uh, on your podcast, but it's so what? Right, so, <laughs> so, so you, so you may have, you may have done this amazing achievement, but. So what, you know, what, do, what, do, what do the audience learn from that? And if, if they don't learn anything, then take it out because that's just about you. That's more ego. You know, you can use that, you can use that experience to um, reinforce something, but if, unless it's adding value to the audience, then it's not needed in the presentation. So I think as soon as you realize it's not about you and it's all about the audience, then there's a light bulb moment. You realize actually, how can I better serve the people who have booked me to speak? Yeah, that's brilliant. I think hopefully a really valuable message for people listening as well. Um, what I'm really keen to do is understand more about Centrum Solutions and, and everything that not only have you built, but that you've got in, in sort of plan for the future. So could you give us a real insight into the purpose behind the organisation and what it is that you, that you do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I mentioned before, I'll just go back one step. I, I, I ran a company, well, it was a company that we converted into a a social enterprise then into a charity called switch to play what switch to play are very good at doing is helping individuals to become more employable and that's helping athletes to 
maximize their potential through and beyond sport. But where that stops is when they're finished it so that their, their object, charitable objectives are not to find them employment, is to help them more employable. And I, when, I, when, when we were running it as a team, um, I spoke to my chair and the board of trustees saying, look, I think we're missing a trick. We need to you know the next, there's a bit missing from what we could offer them. Uh, and quite rightly so, they came back and said, no, we are sticking to what we're good at. We don't want to let other people do that role. We are just going to help them become more employed because it's a really tricky time within two years of when, you know, an athlete finishes sport. That's a, you know, it's quite a challenging period. And then we want to just be, you know, best in class for that area. And I said, okay, that's absolutely fine. I'm going to go and do that with a bit. Uh, and I was right, and I was doing my MBA at the time. And I, I mentioned before, I wrote my thesis around how could I create something which has got the same DNA as a charity and the same, you know, the same uh, fulfillment and purpose that I, I, I got out of running that charity but actually help find employment. So what we do at Centrum, uh, I sort of, I transitioned out of Switch to Play, uh, helped help find my, you know, the, the success that came in and we provide employment. So we partner back with Switch to Play. So Switch to Play, we, we continue to help people become more employable, but what we do at Centrum is we help find employment. And I don't mean jobs, I mean careers. So our, our audience are elite athletes or members of the military, and they're not looking for jobs. You know, we, we, have, we have four categories. So we have people who are at the start of transition, they're transitioning, they're job ready, or they're placeable. Uh, and the difference between those are, depending on where they are, we'll either circle them back around so they can get some support from uh, one of the, our partners. It might be an education, it might be qualification they need, it might be work experience, it might be just CV writing, it might be LinkedIn skill, anything they may need, just to try and move them along. Now, the one which uh, we get a lot of people are who are job ready, they're the ones who people who haven't thought about what's next and they need a job because they've got bills to pay and they've got commitments and the, the, you know when they've left the military the gates hit them on the way out or you know their injuries happened and they've left sport abruptly so we quickly try and help them find their purpose and that's where we're different to a you know a recruitment company we're not a recruitment company we're a career transition company so we help them understand what's important to them you know what were they good at in the previous roles what uh, what are their aims for the future where do they want to be uh, location wise salary wise everything else and then we match them with our clients who we've already screened already, who are looking to recruit from those communities. So they're already looking for someone. They understand, you know, on a CV, they might not get past, they might not go past go, you know, the CV, but they understand they look past the CV to see the individual. So they're higher for potential and then train for skill. So they get in the individual who know they're going to enhance their organizational culture. Um, but they know that once they've understood the industry knowledge or sector knowledge, the rest of the, what they bring to the table. You know, they're ready to put them in a direction and they will fly. So Shine we do. Through, yeah. yeah. So we so we spend a lot of time on that front end of helping people, uh, mentoring them once they're in a place, onboarding them into an organization so that when they're in and that's managing both sides, that's managing expectations from the individual, you know, who, who may have, you know, inflated expectations. So we have to, you know, there's some honest conversations, but equally from the employer side as well around just because this person has achieved excellence in this world. You can't just give them a job and pay them a salary because it's not about money. Yeah, so we, we, we try and help people find their purpose, you know, their reason for getting out of bed in the morning. And it might not be what they, they think it was. And you know, they may have been in, if you've used the military as an example, they may have been doing work in the last couple of years of their career in a certain area. So you work quite a lot with the, you know, the, re the, the engineers. And they think, right, so now I've got to go and do that exact same thing in, in Civvy Street. Where, well, not really. If that's not your, you've got, now you've got a, you know, a blank canvas. What do you want to do? What do your skill sets allow you to do? And then let's map out a path. And it might mean taking a backward step to be able to go forward within, you know, within a year, two years time, but ultimately having that, that I call it a castle on the hill, the thing you're aiming for and, and strategizing, how do you get there? And it's not always going to be the first job you take. It might be the third, fourth or fifth job. But if you don't have that castle that you're aiming for, you could walk around aimlessly. And I think the thing I, I, we've based, Centrum, we base our, our premise on the Japanese concept of Ikigai. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, yeah, yeah, was, yeah. yeah, I wish I'd have known about that when I was playing. And the, you know, it's like a Venn diagram of, uh, you know, what are you good at? What does the world need? What can you get paid for? Yeah, not, not, not how much do you want to earn, but you know, what can you get paid for that allows you to do the thing that you're good at and the world needs and also, you know, what you love doing? And a lot of people, when they, you ask yourself those questions, they might be just outside the centre the center point, the ikigai. So we help them first identify where they are right now and sometimes they might be in a, you know, a dark spot, you know, and they can't see the light or it might be near the light, but we help them identify where they are now and the small steps. And sometimes it is really small steps to move into the light or move into that point. But unless you know, 
the light may seem like it's a long way away. Yeah, I love that concept. And like you, I was only introduced to it post military, in fact, only in the last um, two or three years, to be honest. It's yeah. not something I was familiar with before. But again, it comes back to the purpose piece, doesn't it? And how for people to really understand what are they passionate about? Because I love the point you make about the obvious step. So I would relate it back to I was in the Royal Signals. And at the time when I was serving and then looking to leave, it was actually all around, you know, the boom around the internet and technology. And lots of people were leaving and going into the likes of O2 and Vodafone. And, you know, they go on what seemed to be pretty high salaried roles doing effectively what they've been doing in the military in Civvy Street. And funny enough, a lot of them then weren't happy. They thought that what they wanted was a bigger paycheck to do the same thing. But actually, then they're looking for, for something else. And I think that piece around you don't know what you don't know about what's out there. I think that's the most exciting thing when you're leaving elite sport, or you're leaving the, the world is, is far more vast than we thought in terms of what you could go into. So I think that's an absolutely brilliant point. But is there something that you could share with us around how people can get in the mindset of moving from being either, you know, could be a senior officer or could be someone, as you say, that is, um, you know known around the world for what they've achieved in sport how can they come back into that space of being more grounded and as you say take that that back, backward step sometimes or perceived backward step how how are there any lessons that you can share that the people might be able to take on yeah I think that it's a really simple one really and it's just about having that plan you know that that, that career pathway that plan way where, where do you want to get to uh, and then a timeline of how long you're going to give yourself to get there and absolutely, you have to, you know, a lot of the times you, you go sideways, you go back. It, no, it's never in a straight line ever. Is it ever. I don't know anyone who's literally gone from zero to successful and never had a blip. So it's always up and down and roundabout and everything else. But unless you have that plan of knowing where you're going to, where you'd like to get to, you don't know which direction you're going in and you can be going around aimlessly. And I think that's really important to understand to help people do that, to figure out what it is, understand what skill sets you've got now, where do you need to, you know, better yourself. And develop yourself i know from the you know just from the candidates that we work with self-improvement and you know cpd that's a, a given everyone wants to be better feedback is a must uh, and you don't we sort of crave it because you want to get better so that's going to happen so it's, the, the hardest part is I, i've set, spending some time thinking about what's important to you your family your circumstances and then just flipping it and not thinking about you being a former something and thinking about the thing you're transitioning from more, rather think about what you're transitioning to so then when you focus your mind on, right, I'm trying to do something. And I think it was uh, Serena Williams more recently. I stopped, I stopped using the word retirement. I use retirement or life after sport. You know, that, and that was 15 years ago. I stopped using retirement because retirement is quite final, isn't it? You sort of retired, bang, what next? Whereas you're not retiring, you're just transitioning into something else. So I was really big on pushing the word transition. And then uh, Serena talked about evolving. And I like the word evolving because that's a little, it's taken transition to evolving. Into something else because you've got the skills and now you're in a better place to evolve into something bigger and better next i think that's um i think that's that's crucial as well the language that you the self-talk that you have how, how do you you know talk to yourself and the, the plan that you have in place i think that's really important about getting allowing yourself to be excited about where you're going grateful for what you've where you've been and the skills and the experience it's given you but that's a launch pad to where you're going next I think that's absolutely spot on. Um, and I'm sure lots of people can relate relate to that as well. But going back to Centrum and the, the sort of programme, and you said that people might be in one of those four different categories. So I know that it could vary depending on who they are and where they, they sit on that cycle. But what would you say is the sort of average length of time frame that somebody would spend gauging in part of that programme until they find themselves placeable and placed in on the next step of their new chapter because you're right it doesn't mean that's them forever but yeah. you know moving into the you know the, the next phase what's that time frame look like uh, typically research said it's around two years um but i, I what we're trying to do we, we we work on prevention rather than cure so don't wait until you're finished and then start thinking about it because then it probably will be more likely to be longer and be two years so we try and work with people who are either still competing from the sporting uh, example so they're still like thinking about life outside of sport not life after sport so because you know if you're a better person you'll be a better athlete same in the military as well you know better people make better whatever they're going to do 
So we're working. And we're all black or better people make yeah, exactly. all black. So I remember exactly. that sort of thing. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then all the same for the military. Like sometimes they get a TX date, they would have a top point in time when they know that's the end. So don't wait till then. What can you be doing from, we work with people now who are 18 months, two years out. So that means they they can get qualified and get upskilled. They can do whatever they, the idea, explore areas which they think they might want to go into and realize, you know what, I thought I wanted to do that and I don't want to do it now. You're better off doing that before you're out. You know, if you've got the opportunity to practice those and then get upskilled and get qualifications. So the earlier you start to think about the inevitable, the better you'll be. And it's all part of that planning piece. Uh, planning piece. So you can reduce your two years down to 12 months to six months uh, you know by working with somebody spending a day work experience or having a coffee with somebody who's in that role and just getting a feel for the type of organization or the culture that it is or the, the sector that you might want to go into that can remove the anxiety around thinking what can I add to the world when I leave here you know who am I what can I add to the world so by doing that earlier you can get rid of some of the noise and find out the stuff that you don't want to do and you can reduce your spinning templates down to might be spinning three plates because you don't know, but three plates is far better than spinning templates because some of those ten are going to uh, smash. And yeah. I, you know that's they're the lessons that I that I I went through and I failed. I smashed lots of plates, so my aim is yeah. to have people not smash, smash, smash as many plates. Yeah, just and you probably saw by the look on my face, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who would be surprised, particularly those who haven't left. When you go two years, that feels like a long time, and particularly yeah. certainly it used to be. I don't know if it well, I think it still is now, it's a 12 month, it used to be a 12 month minimum sign off period. So for a lot of people, they would, until they'd signed off, it, that would be, okay, I'll do something about it now. And then often it would be, oh, at the six month point when you're getting engaged with, use of, you know, CTP, the Career Transition yeah. Partnership, you go, oh yeah, best write a CV. And it was almost the, oh, time suddenly catching up. Whereas what you're saying is it can take a lot longer. And if you leave it to that point, you are going to find yourself potentially either going up and down a lot more than you need to or or not finding yourself placed in a role that you you probably go and deserve and, and fly through yeah and you find yourself in a, in a job the aim is to not find yourself in a job that you just every sunday night you're like oh i've got work tomorrow mm. i don't i don't want to do that you know so, you know sometimes you have to do that and I, I appreciate that but the more you can do to help yourself give yourself a head start you know it's coming you know, the, you, there's so much research. You can just speak to your peers to know it is tough. You can make it easier by planning and giving yourself a head start by putting yourself in touch with the right people, doing the right qualifications, everything else, because it's, the inevitable is it's, it's going to happen at some point. Yeah, yeah. I wish I'd known that when I left yeah. and quit my first job after three months because you can tell it was a job and yeah. I totally made the wrong turn and the wrong decision. So. Yeah, I can. I, I wish I'd known that then. Um, I'm conscious that, you know, we, we could talk all day. I think there's so much in there. And hopefully for our listeners, they want to find out more. Um, and I, I, I know for sure that I'm going to be looking to, to find out more and continue our conversation. So thanks for sharing everything with us today. But are there some final thoughts or, or signposts that you want to share so that, you know, those listening can, can really take hold of, of what you offer? Yeah, I think I think um, start now. I think that the best, you know, when's the best time to plant a tree? It was twenty years ago. When the second best time is now. I think now, if you're thinking about something, do it now. Even even in small stages, just do something now, and you'll find momentum will build. Uh, we talked about two years before, or even twelve months. That goes very quickly, and just by doing small steps, you just by identifying there's so many opportunities around us, and you're just not open. You just not your eyes are not open to them because you might be not aware of them. So just by having those conversations with people you might be able to identify something. And the aim is to try and find a role that you're as passionate about, if not more passionate about next, because you've been doing it a lot longer. And I think so delaying it, um, I've not met anyone who's delayed it and come away going, oh, I'm really glad I delayed making that decision. <laughs> that, that's one thing. So I think just making that first step and it might be a conversation, it might be a coffee, it might be something really small and then let the momentum build. Yeah, that's brilliant. Like you say, small steps. and another few sort of points that I draw out if that's okay and it's more that I've, I've sort of taken from what you've said is that being curious as you say really trying to find out about what people do what does it feel like when you're working those environments I really got from how your journey that you've been curious you remain curious and you that's how you really sort of feel where you are now connections I think what we've spoken about I think going back to that point you said as well about not falling into a job Try to understand what you don't want to do. Yeah. And sometimes that helps you narrow in 
where you want to get to and sometimes you only learn through experience so uh, that's unfortunate and I think two other things if it's okay I'd really I think a, a golden nuggets you are not your job that whole piece around define your identity by who you are, what you believe in, what makes you passionate um, and why people want to spend time with you rather than your title. And I think, again, similar to you, myself and others that I'm sure can relate have done exactly that. And I know I did when I first left. And core skills, what X um, sports people, military, they have an abundance of those core skills. So refine them, hone in on them and share them. Um, I think they're just brilliant messages. So anything else you want to add, Leon, as you just say thank you for your time? I do want to add, I want to say congratulations on your MBA. I know and good luck oh, with it because you. because it's a it's a you won't regret it. It's awesome and you'll learn so much about yourself. So yeah, but thanks for having me on and uh, yeah hopefully it's been useful. Yeah, it's been brilliant. Really enjoyed it and I'm sure it's been useful for those listening. So thanks Leon and hope to speak again soon. Thank you.